love incarnate love divine star and angels gave the sign bow to babe on bended knee the savior of humanity To us a child is born He shall reign forevermore No
hold up uh, Neil, please, if you could kneel with us and sing our prayer song. Just the refrain only of Thou Dost Do Thy Will. we come into your presence joyfully and thankfully we come into your presence knowing that because of this day because this day we we come remembering that you are in blessed because we remember that you are helping us to remember oh god we thank you you came dear jesus we we celebrate at this time of year, but you came knowing that there would be complications. That it was complicated in the relationship before, that it was complicated then, and that it's complicated now. We recognize and for our part in making it complicated, we ask your forgiveness. Because it's very plain to us today as on many other occasions that you came in love, that you came to put us together with you in the kingdom of love. And Jesus, we, we want to stop at this moment and we want to say, we love you. We want to be in your kingdom. We want to be part of your family of love. May we, as we go through this season, Remember how we are attached to all humanity and that you came for all humanity and that you came not just for the church. You came not just for those who come to church, but you came for everybody. Yes, Lord. Amen. May our actions speak of our relationship with you that they will know we are Christ's followers the babe in Bethlehem because of our love. For these and other mercies, for the grace and power that it will take to be your children in the coming year, we thank you. Our Lord and our Master and our King. Amen. I'd like to invite the deaconesses and deacons to come forward for the offering. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I think we can be louder than that. Let's, let's try that one more time. Happy Sabbath. Okay. Is it Christmas? Are we in the Christmas season? Let's try this one more time and like, let's get it all the way out to Lyons Avenue. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. There you go. Merry Christmas. I don't know about you guys, um, but it's been a long year. It's been a long year for all of us. We've seen a lot of stuff happen this year. Um, mass shootings, uh, a lot of uh, political jargon going on. Uh, makes you think about a lot of things, but um, I, I would like to pause for this Christmas and um, think about the people that we should hold closer to us, um, who we should call, who we should forgive, who we should love again. So. Maybe this Christmas 
dreams will mean something more maybe the sheer love will appear deeper than ever before maybe forgiveness will ask us to call someone we love and someone we've lost for reasons we can't quite recall oh maybe this christmas maybe there'll be an open door maybe the star that shined before will shine once more Maybe there'll be an open door. Maybe the star that has shined before will shine once more. Maybe forgiveness will ask us to call someone we love. Someone we've lost for reasons we can't quite recall. Oh, 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 oh. maybe this Christmas, maybe there'll be an open door. Maybe the star that shined before will shine once more and maybe this Christmas will find us to last in heaven at peace prayed for at least for the love we've been shown in the past Oh, maybe this Christmas, mm -hmm. maybe this Christmas, oh, maybe this Christmas.
nature's agent, everything this love, God's love, rejoice, give thanks, and sing. So this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he first loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, Shouldn't we love one another in the same way? No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. One dollar and 87 cents. That was all. That was all she had put aside. One cent and then another and then another. In her careful buying of meat and other foods, Della counted it three times. One dollar and 87 cents. And then the next day would be Christmas. There was nothing for Della to do but fall on the bed and cry. Furnished rooms costed eight dollars a week. There was little more to say about it. It was small, but it was theirs. In the hall below, there was a box. And it was a letter box, but it was too small to hold a letter. And they had an electric doorbell too, but it didn't make a sound. But next to it, on the door, read the name, Mr. James Dillingham Young. Mr. James Dillingham Young was being paid $30 a week. Now, when he, was, when he was only being paid 20 a week, the name seemed too long and important. It perhaps should have been Mr. James D. Young. But when Mr. James Dellingham Young entered the furnished flat, his name became very short indeed. Della finished her crying and cleaned the marks that it had left on her face. She stood by the window and looked out the glass with no interest. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, but she only had a dollar and 87 cents to buy a Christmas present for Jim. She had saved up for months, but this is all she had. You see, $20 a week wasn't much, and she realized that everything was so much more expensive. That's how it always happened. So, she had a dollar and 87 cents to buy him a present, a present for Jim. She had many happy hours planning something nice for him, something nearly good enough for him, something almost worth the honor of belonging to Jim. Her eyes were shining brightly, but her face had lost its color. Quickly, she pulled her hair down and let it fall to its complete length. The James Dellingham Youngs were very proud of two things which they had owned. One thing was Jim's gold watch. It once had belonged to his father, and long ago it belonged to his father's father. The watch was alone. It was without a chain that would hold it together. And as much as Jim cherished the watch, it was always being misplaced because it had no chain to connect to. The other thing was Della's hair. If a queen had lived in the rooms next to theirs, Della would have washed and dried her hair where the queen would have seen it. Della knew her hair was more beautiful than any queen's jewels and gifts. If a king had lived in the same house with all his riches, Jim's, Jim would have looked at his watch every time they met. Jim knew 
that no king had anything so valuable. This Christmas, Jim wanted to buy Dahlia something important, something beautiful, something that she wanted so badly, but never thought to buy herself. Months ago, walking by a window, she had seen a set of beautiful combs with jewels in them, perfect for her hair, perfect for her hair. She had known that they cost too much for her to buy. She had looked at them, and without the least of hope of ever owning them. So now, Della's beautiful hair fell about her, falling like a shining brown waterfall. It reached below her knee. It almost made itself into a dress for her. And then she put it up on top of her head again, quickly and nervously. Once she stopped for a moment and stood still, while a tear or two ran down her face, she put on her old brown coat and her old brown hat. And with her eyes shining brightly, she ran out the door and down the street. She stopped at a sign that said, Mrs. Sonifree's hair articles of all kinds. And up to the floor, to the second floor, Della ran, only stopping at the top to catch her breath. Mrs. Sonifree, large, old, cold-eyed, looked at her. Please buy my hair, Della asked. Yeah, I buy hair, said Mrs. Sonifree. Let me take a look at it. Take your hat down and let your hair out. And so the brown waterfall fell. Twenty dollars, said Mrs. Sonifree. And she lifted it to feel its weight. Please do it quickly, said Della. And oh, the next two hours flew. She was going from one shop to the next to try and find the perfect present for Jim. And finally, she had found it. Surely it had been made just for him, for there was no other like it in any other store. And she went to every single store in the city. It was a gold watch chain, very simply made. Its value was in rich and wonderful material. Because it was so plain and simple, you knew that it was very valuable. All good things were like that. It was good enough for the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew she had to get it for Jim. It was like him, quietness and value. Jim and the chain both had quietness and value. She paid $21 for it. And she hurried home with the chain and the 87 cents in her pocket. And with the chain on his watch, Jim could look at his watch and learn the time anywhere he went. She knew it. When Delia arrived home, her mind quieted a little. She began to think more reasonably. She started to try to cover the sad remarks, the sad marks of what she had done. Love and large hearted giving when added together, can leave deep marks. It is never too easy to cover these marks, dear friends. It's never easy. Within 40 minutes, her head looked a little better. With her short hair, she looked wonderful, wonderful like a schoolboy. She stood for a long time and looked in the mirror. Jim is going to kill me, Della said. But what could I do? What could I do with a dollar and 87 cents? At seven, Jim's dinner was ready for him. Jim was never late. Della held the watch chain in her hand and sat next to the entrance by which he had usually walked in. Then she heard his step in the hall and her face lost color for a moment. She would always say quiet little prayers to herself. And this time she said, please God, please make Jim still think I'm pretty. The door opened and Jim stepped in. He looked very thin and he wasn't smiling. Poor fellow, he was, he was only 22, with a wife to take care of. He needed a new coat and he had nothing to cover his hands. Jim stopped inside the door. He was quiet as a hunting dog. And near its bird. His eyes looked strangely at Della, and there was an expression to them that she could not understand. 
had filled her with fear. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor anything she had been ready for. He simply looked at her with that strange expression in his face. Della went to him. Jim, dear, don't look at me like that, she said. I had my hair cut off, and I sold it. I couldn't live through Christmas without buying you such a wonderful gift, and, and I needed some more money. My hair will grow again. You don't care, do you? My hair grows back really fast. Jim, it's Christmas. Let's just be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a nice and beautiful gift I got you. You've cut off your hair, asked Jim slowly. He seemed to labor and understand what had happened. He seemed not to feel sure he knew. Cut off and sold it, Della said. Do you still like me? I, I'm still me. I'm still the same without my hair, Jim. Jim looked around the room. You, you say your hair is gone? Jim, there's no use in looking for it. it. It's gone. I cut it off and I sold it. It's the night before Christmas. Jim, please be good to me. I sold it for you. Maybe the hairs in my head could be counted. But never the love. My love for you could never be counted. Shall we eat dinner, Jim? Jim put his arm around his Della. For 10 seconds, let us look in another direction. Eight dollars a week or a million dollars a year, how different are they? Some may give you an answer, but it will be wrong. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. By meaning, will be explained soon. From inside the coat, Jim took something tied in paper, and he set it upon the table. I want you to understand me, Dell, he said. Nothing like a haircut could ever make me love you any less. But if you open that, you may know how I felt when I came in. Her fingers pulled off the paper, and then a cry of joy changed to tears. For there lay the combs, these combs that Della had seen in the shop window and loved for a long time. Now, now they were hers, but her hair was gone. She held them to her heart and at last was able to look up and say, my hair grows fast, Jim. And then she jumped up and cried, oh no, Jim had not seen his beautiful gift yet. She held it out to him in her open hand. The gold seemed shiny and soft as if it was her own loving spirit. It's, isn't it perfect, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at your watch a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. Let me see it. Let me see how they look together. Jim sat down and smiled. Della, he said, let's put our Christmas gifts away and keep them for a while. They are too nice to use now. I sold the watch to get the money to buy the combs. And now I think we should have our Christmas dinner. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the newborn Christ child. They were the first to give Christmas gifts, being wise. Their gifts were doubtless wise ones. And here I have told you the story of two children who were not wise, each sold the most valuable thing they owned. But let me speak the last words to the wise of these days. Of all the gifts, these two were the most wise. Of all who give and receive gifts as much as they are the most wise, everywhere they are the wise ones, they are the magi. Red sky at night. What? 
sailors, oh, you must be from the coast. <laughs> Those of us who are not from the coast, we say red sky at night, shepherds, delight. Ah, but red sky in the morning, sailors, again, you must be from Long Beach. Shepherds warning. So when the angel first appeared to the shepherds, that was amazing. That was amazing. But when the angel choir revealed themselves, because I, I am sure that they were in another dimension and all they had to do was just go from dimension to dimension and suddenly there was an angel host with him. Well, <laughs> that... That was stunning. And thinking I'd run to town to see the Messiah too. Wouldn't you? The son of David, this one that is born in David's town. News of great joy, he said. The one, the one who was to come. The shepherds, you see, were, were asked to verify. Shepherds, stunned and amazed. Shepherds, not priests. The shepherds are invited to the cave. Oh yes, we, we put up wood because we build our houses with wood but probably not so in Bethlehem. You see, because the sheep pen where Jesus was born was probably a cave. The angel said that he would be wrapped in strips of cloths, cloth strips. King James calls them swaddling clothes. You could say in North American Indian language, he would be papoost. Where would, the, where would a carpenter get such strips of cloths in a night when the little town of Bethlehem was crowded, prepped for a Roman census? Answer, he already had them with him. Answer, he had them with him because every good Jewish man who went on a journey took his grave clothes, his grave cloths with him. Standard procedure. And here, brought by a, a Roman decree, you have Joseph grabbing a hold of all that he had in the cave next to his wife who had just given birth to a son that he knew was not his. And he took his grave clothes and he wrapped the baby. He swaddled the baby. The angel said he will be wrapped in grave clothes, lying in a manger, a feeding trough, in a stable out back of the inn. That's what the angel said. A stable, a cave, lots of caves in Bethlehem, should you care to go and see. So the angel tells the shepherds, their Messiah, the King, the Son of David, the one who was to come, which is the meaning of Messiah, would be found in a cave, wrapped in grave clothes, lying in a feeding trough. This was grenade number three. Grenade number one, an angel appears to the shepherds. Grenade number two, the angel chorus sings to them, and now the Messiah, the long-awaited one, the anointed one, the one that was really, really needed right now because of this wretched Roman occupation, was to be found in a cave out back of the inn. 
Either you lie there and hold on to whatever little reality that makes sense to you, or you, you jump up and, and you dash into town. This was their choice. Don't know about you <laughs> this Christmas. But I want to be a shepherd. I want to be a shepherd. These low-born, working-class, regular Joes were the first choice. The first choice of the heavenly director as entourage for the entrance of the king. I'm wanting to be a shepherd this Christmas. I like to think as as we tell this story again in 2017, that we would all like to play the part of a shepherd. Yes, the parts of Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, mother of God, surrogate, adoptive, earthly father of God. But not likely that many will be picked for these roles. So, most likely, the role available in this greatest story ever told is Shepherd. Uh, so, I, I'm, I'm choosing. If I'm going to be something in the story this Christmas, I, I, I'm going to be a shepherd. Not that shepherds were highly sought after people or their jobs, uh, were high on the list of jobs that Jewish mothers would hope that their kids would wind up with one day. Okay, here's, here's my New York mother's uh, understanding. Okay, some of you from New York, ready? Here we go. My son, the doctor. My son, the lawyer. My son, the CEO of Levi's. My son, the shepherd. You see what I'm saying? Not very high on the list of those professions that mothers would have been happy for. Nonetheless, I'm planning to be a shepherd this Christmas. See, the director, God Almighty, decided who would be in the lucky position to play the role that first Noel. Maybe, maybe, maybe this was plan C on his part for the Savior's entrance scene. I, I don't know. Maybe the director was hoping the priests and Levites would be wanting this part in the scene. Maybe the director had, huge, had a huge argument or a huge, huge discussion with himself. Shall I, shall I choose Herod? Like Jewish leaders, maybe Herod had a nephew that he hadn't already killed. Maybe Uncle Herod announces his nephew is the Messiah. How would that have gone down with the Romans? No one knows. How would, they, how would it have gone with Herod, you see? Because Herod had this, this problem. He, he really didn't like anyone to be better than him. He killed everybody that tried to be him. We know this because of what he did two years after Jesus was born. He, he killed all the babies, all the baby boys. So the director's choice was limited. It was limited. You see, that's why I want to be, I want to be a shepherd this Christmas. Maybe because shepherds were humble. They, they never thought too highly of themselves. Maybe because they had time to contemplate the need for a savior and really we're looking forward to his arrival for whatever reason the director picked shepherds for this most amazing entrance scene in the most amazing story ever told he picked shepherds that's why that's why i want to be a shepherd this christmas why I want to offer you the role as well. Do you want to be a shepherd? 
Amen. We're going to sing together now. I'm going to grab hold of all my friends who want to sing. Hark. The herald angels sing. You see, as we sing together this song, you can cement your promise to God that you too want to be ready. You want to be ready for him to come again the second time. You want to be ready like the shepherds were ready. Let's not be like those who knew Jesus was coming and were not ready. Let's be like those who were in the fields that night to whom an angel came and a chorus of angels. And we now have the opportunity on this Christmas Sabbath to sing back to our Heavenly Father, the, the director of all the universe, and say, we want to be shepherds just like our Heavenly Shepherd, our Father. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your one and only, your only begotten Son, that we at this time of year may sing your praises for life, life both now in this world and life in the next. For these mercies, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.